Yeah, I think it's great you've got this podcast. I think I mentioned it to you before. It's nice that you've got a space for not just writers, right? It's it's people who have stories to share. And I mean, everybody has stories to share, but people that you've selected to come and talk a little bit about their background. Well, it's 99 that we're hoping to record. 99 voices. And uh, by the end of the 99th, the idea is to get everybody's recording into SD cards and then put it in a capsule with all the visuals printed out and then bury it. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, because then there will be a record of us. <laughs> yes. yes. 99 right. women. 99 women. Not bottles, but women. A lovely idea. It's a sentiment, a way of bearing witness, you know, that we were yes. here. And... Because I, I've often wondered, like, what would happen one day if everything just got wiped out from the internet or if the internet doesn't work anymore? What's going to happen mm. to records? It'll forever be gone because it's all digital. And technology keeps updating. That's right. Today, we're looking at SD cards and um, all these kinds of technology um, on the cloud. And uh, on the cloud means it's sitting on some server. Now, mm. What happens to all those um, dat tapes or, you know, even the uh, old floppy disks, <laughs> CD-ROMs? What's going to happen to all that data? You know? So, like, whole of 1980s music, it was all on, like, tapes... TVs. Yes, yes, right. VCRs. VCRs, exactly. Welcome to the Listen by Heart podcast, where we feature stories from women of the South China Sea. I'm Jasmine Lowe, and today I will be joined by Shivani Siva Guru Nathan, an author and educator. She's head of school, assistant professor, research director, director of postgraduate studies, senior tutor, Faculty of Arts at the University of Nottingham in Malaysia. Yes, Malaysia, not the UK. And she has an interest in post-colonial literature, and in particular, literature surrounding the topics of Indian diaspora and contemplative pedagogy. Shivani has been writing and publishing fiction and poetry for 20 years, and teaching for about 12 years. Her first book, Wild Life on Coal Island was published by UPM Press in 2011 and republished by HarperCollins India in 2012. The Indian writer Tabish Khair described the book as R.K. Narayan's Malguri turned into an island meets Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book in this highly readable collection of stories by a new and distinctive voice from Malaysia. Here I am sitting in Penang where Rudyard Kipling was apparently um, writing lots of stories in the ENO hotel in Penang. And here I am also sitting across from Shivani while she is in a room, in a private studio room in the University of Nottingham in Malaysia. Now her second book, Yalpanam, is her first novel and it was published by Penguin Southeast Asia in September 2021. While many of us were stuck in rooms or getting well or some feverish. Her short stories and poems have appeared in numerous international journals and magazines, including Cha, an Asian literary magazine, Agenda, Construction Literary Magazine, and many others. Her poetry collection, Being Born, and her book of fiction, What Has Happened to Harry Pillay, Two Novellas, will be out later this year. Shivani currently teaches English literature and creative writing at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia, and is working on her next novel. Hi, Shivani. Welcome to the Listen by Heart podcast. Hi, Jasmine. Thanks so much for having me on this fantastic podcast. I think it's absolutely wonderful that you've got this platform for people like myself um, to come and share stories because sharing stories is such a fundamental part of being human. So thanks very much for having this podcast and for inviting me to be on it. It's an immense pleasure to have you and thanks also to Chuan Guat Inc. for introducing us. Even though we have actually met in Penang, incidentally, we met in Penang at the Georgetown Literary Festival a few years ago. 
Do you remember it was that? <laughs> Ten years ago, Jasmine, time time has really you know sped by. Because it was in 2012, I remember you hosted a poetry event that I was participating in. Goodness gracious, was it 10 years? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let let's start with um, an introduction. I mean, some listeners may have already picked up your book, your very attractive covers. I love them so much, especially Yalpanam. It just really tugs onto coattails, you know, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know why, I can't explain it, but maybe there is something about Yalpanam, which incidentally, I, I understand it means Jaffna. Yes, it's the Tamil word for Jaffna in Sri Lanka, which is where my grandparents came from and where the Salonis in Malaysia uh, originally come from. Tell, tell us a little bit more about Jaffna. Have you been there? I have actually, only once in 2009 when the civil war was officially declared over. And I went with my father and stayed in a little B&B and visited family. So we still have many members of uh, our family living there. In um, Basically, it's, it's, it's very underdeveloped. Yeah? Jaffna is very underdeveloped. It's basically villages. Um, and... Yeah, we spent around a week um, being with the relatives. Unfortunately for me, there was a language barrier because I am your quintessential coconut. So that means that (laughs) um, I think most people know what coconut means. uh, But essentially, I don't... Rough on the outside and smooth on the inside? (laughs) That's exactly (laughs) it, Jasmine. Yes, yes. (laughs) Or green on the outside and white on the inside? Uh, yes, uh, very much yeah, green, green. Uh, green. green. The lang- there was a language barrier, uh, so I don't speak Tamil. Um, and it was a very interesting experience because I definitely sensed in a very tangible way the, the separation between myself and my relatives. I mean, some of them were quite closely connected to me um, in terms of, uh, you know, th- these were my grandmother's um you know quite close relatives and so but thankfully my father was there and he he can speak um sri lankan tamil which is quite different actually from the tamil that we um recognize being spoken here in malaysia which it oh, comes right? mainly okay. from south india yeah right. um so yes it on, was on that on that know, note that sure. difference i would mm. love to hear some intonation like um when you say it's different in fact last night i was just watching an episode of antanao have you heard of this little um, series that's being aired on on astro it's uh, produced by marin and indrani Koko. no i haven't i don't have a tv i <laughs> i get my entertainment from uh, netflix wow so well maybe you could share some words like um in in tamil um, if if I may, just so that we can hear the sounds of it, but the difference between Sri Lankan Tamil and Southern Indian Tamil. Okay, right now I wish I had my dad here because <laughs> he would be, really be able to give you lots of examples. As I said, I don't speak Tamil, I can understand Tamil, uh, but I do know some words. So there are, for example, words that are different in the South Indian Tamil that is mainly spoken here. Um, and then the Sri Lankan Tamil. So, for example, the word for chair in uh, South Indian Tamil is nakali, nakali. And in the Salonis Tamil, um, so my parents, for example, would call that, not they wouldn't call it nakali, they'd call it kadare. Yeah, yeah, it's very different, exactly. So the couple of things that I've picked up on in terms of the differences, one is the different words like that. Um, I do know other examples, but right now I can't think of any. The other is the um, the lilt. So the Sri Lankan Tamil is very, very musical, um, very rhythmic. And um, I, I, <laughs> I don't think I should attempt to uh, sort of replicate that lilt here because I won't have any words to use, but um, it's, oh, well, it's, I... this way. it's very musical. Because my grandmother used to take me to watch Hindi films, but that was mm. Hindi films, right? Growing up in Malaysia, we, we both have that same heritage where where we grew up with all kinds of languages and all kinds of um, intonations surrounding us. Mm. I mean, we would hear uh, an Indian uncle saying, Inge por inge. Mm, mm. So it, that's in Southern... And, and in Sri Lankan Tamil, how would it sound? Okay, I can't. So, so this is where um, my limitations are going to be very, very obvious. <laughs> I won't be able to give you um, an example of that. 
<laughs> I'm putting um, you on the spot. I'm sorry. You are. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. But um, these days, I am far more open about the fact that I don't know Tamil. I mean, it was very much a source of shame, you know, before this. It still is, mm-hmm. but I think it has converted into healthy shame in the sense that I'm aware that this is a limitation. Um, you know, the way we were brought up, and this is not in any way, you know, an accusation uh, of my parents or the way we were brought up, but there was an emphasis on learning English and on being very, very good in English. Um, you know, my parents were English teachers. The books that we had at home were mainly English books. Um, my mother also emphasized reading and writing in Malay. So we had many books in Malay too. So efficiency in languages was emphasized. Unfortunately, not efficiency in our own language, you know, our native language. No, I totally understand. I, I think yeah, growing up in post-colonial Malaya, yes. th- there was this... Um, urgency for us to be assimilated or gentrified you know yes. and and our parents did, there was that sense of urgency you know to to send your children overseas to australia or england or not so yes. much america but i think uh, our generation most of us went to uh, other sort of uh, commonwealth countries canada um, some even went to germany or taiwan mm. and japan and korea but in in your case, coming from um, Sri Lankan heritage and visiting the town like you know Yalpanam, mm. which has inspired now your book, tell us a little bit more about your generational history, if if you if you could. Sure. So my grandparents came to Malaya at the time in the early twentieth century. So both my grandfathers, the maternal grandfather and paternal grandfather, left Ceylon at that time and Jaffna, because they lived in in Jaffna um, or Yalpanam, to work, to work in Malaya. So um, the British needed administrators to work in their various colonies, including Malaya. So this was part of a recruitment program created by the British um, because they needed, you know, work a workforce here, particularly in administration, and they found that the Sri Lankan Tamils or the Salonis, uh, the, the Tamils from Ceylon, were particularly were particularly appealing for this because number one, they were very compliant, they were very intelligent, and thirdly, they were educated in the British system. Many of them could uh, speak and and write in English, and they knew the British colonial system. So they were basically perfect candidates uh, to work as administrators in uh, British Malaya. So people like my grandparents, uh, my grandfathers uh, came through that system, through that route. And the women followed um, after that. So my grandfather, for example, um, married my grandmother. My grandmother was um, uh, lived in a, in a village in Jaffna. And then she, you know, they got married and then she moved to Malaya. How old how old were they at that time? Um my grandmothers would have been very young. So my maternal grandmother has an interesting story because she came here as an orphan and she was very young. So the way she came here was not typical. So she was I think around 5 years old and she came with her half sister who had um, married somebody who was working in Malaya. So she followed them. My paternal grandmother came um, because she had married my grandfather and she would have been, if I'm not mistaken, in her late teens. So it was common for um, marriage to take place at a, at a young age, particularly for women. Would, would that have been in the 1900s or even way back 1800s? Uh, no, it would have been early 1900s. So I can't give you the exact year, but it would have been around... Uh, 1920 in the 1920s oh the heydays mm. yes yes heydays of british colonialism yes um i have seen pictures of the ships that actually plied um calcutta and singapore calcutta penang mm. mumbai or bombay uh, penang and bombay singapore and then it also connected all the way up uh, north to china uh, to well my my great grandfather was from swatow or 
Today it's called Shanto. So this this particular podcast is actually investigating people who are now living in Malaysia, but uh, and and we have the South China Sea surrounding this area, right? So that's like our playground, our ocean, oceanic playground. But your heritage comes from even way back, like further to mm-hmm. towards um, the Indian Ocean, and you would have had to cross. I mean, your your grandmothers would have had to cross the Andaman Sea, which was probably quite treacherous. I I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've always just wondered when they were on board that ship. You know what what could have been going through their heads? I mean, they're going to some place unknown. Yes. Yes. How brave they must have been. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, I have the same questions and the same imaginings because it's so easy to just take the facts as facts, you know, as as sentences, as abstractions. Like, oh, my grandparents left Ceylon in the 1920s and started their lives here in Malaya and had their children and you know set up their whole lives here. You know, we can tell the stories, but have we really stopped to consider what that actually means? You know. Yes. Um, often I think about my grandmothers, for example, both lost their husbands at a young age um, and had seven or eight children. So my paternal grandmother had seven children. She was widowed in her 30s. Same for my maternal grandmother, who had eight children, widowed young as well. Both my grandfathers died when they were 50. And then I think about what life must have been like for them, because they were very new to the place, you know, they didn't necessarily have that sense of belonging, you know, which they would have felt in Salon, you know, having grown up there, knowing the the people there, the culture, the land, you know, everything is, you know, they were born and raised there and then they were essentially uprooted and then placed in another location that has its own language, its own people, its own food, you know, everything is different the kind of adjustments they would have had to make and they didn't have the same access to things that I have access to now. For example, education, language, technology. You know, I'm much more of a global citizen than they would have been then. So not knowing the language, not having a job and then raising seven or eight children. What would that have been like, you see? It's astounding. I have come to realise why I hold your book Yalpana I hold it with deep uh, reverence because that cover now I've just realised while you're talking I grew up um, with a very very awesome neighbour the Duttons so it was um, Auntie Patsy and Uncle Justin Dutton they were, they were from Sri Lanka mm-hmm. or they are Salonis and my best friend from school Carolyn Dutton her grandma looks exactly like that lady on your book. Okay, so Jasmine, I have, to, I have to interrupt you right now and say the number of people who have told me that. They, the cover is the first thing that they mention and then they say, that looks like my amama, that looks like my archie, that looks like my grandmother, looks like an auntie I know. And it's actually based on a photograph of my grandmother. So the, my paternal Love grandmother, it. Uh, it was a photograph of her, you know, because by that point she was a widow, so she wore white white sari that was the, uh-huh. the, the, the garb of the widow and um, it was taken during um, a birthday celebration she was standing in front of a, a, a cake and it was in a garden and she just looked exactly like my character Pushpanagi and how I envisioned Pushpanagi to be and I sent that photograph to the cover designer and I said can you can we have this actual photograph on the, the front cover but of course it was a very old photograph so the resolution wasn't high enough for them to use it and she just created this painting. Uh, she created a painting based on that um, photograph. What was the name of your grandmothers? And I'm not asking the name of your grandfathers with full respect to all of them. Yeah. But we, we want to focus on grandmothers um, because we usually call them by our local tongue, you know, whatever the mm-hmm. name is for grandmother. And often... We do not know the names of our the women it's, who came before us, you know? It's so interesting because my entire paternal family did not know, extended family, did not know the name of my grandmother's mother until I, as a five-year-old or four or five-year-old child, um, asked the question to my grandmother, 
and made the announcement to everyone like do you know that your grandmother's name this is I was telling my aunties and my father do you know that your grandmother's name was Katpaham and they were like how did you find out i asked because <laughs> they didn't know um and it's so true isn't it we we just know them by archi amama popo right we 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 don't actually know what their names were it's as though they are just they just exist in their roles um we don't see all their dimensions as a human being um so yes my my paternal grandmother was called anama and my maternal grandmother was called mageshwari God bless their souls. Um, Absolutely. Wherever they may be on 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 this realm, or, well, not not this realm anymore. But they are in Malay. They say bertungkus lumus. Mm, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, they slogged. They um they endured um, and they were incredibly resilient. You know, this appreciation has only come in the last few years for me. I have to say. I think because of my own struggles and my own you know when you encounter your own struggles you have no choice but to look back and looking back not just in your personal history as an individual there's no such thing by the way as an individual this is something that I've really discovered that an individual is made up of so many components histories culture mm-hmm. we are all so interconnected and if you are looking at yourself really deeply and sincerely you'll find your ancestors there and you know as i began to get serious about investigating you know the what i'm thinking what i'm feeling what i'm believing my psychological patterns you know why do some of these issues arise why am i having these problems inevitably let me back actually to my ancestors my grandmothers um my grandfather's too of course but in the last year i have been looking more closely at the lives of my grandmothers um and getting more information it still it's definitely a source of pain for me that i didn't talk to them as much as i would have liked to have talked to them they're no longer alive so um my paternal grandmother passed away when i was 14 but i spent every single day of my life with her because she lived in port dickson where i grew up it was a daily ritual and i i use the word ritual not in a negative term because sometimes that can seem like you know a duty or obligation you know performing this ritual but it was a daily delight i could i can say to visit her so every evening we would go to her house and just hang out and as so i was very very close with her and she used to speak to me in tamil so so here is another mystery for you she used to speak to me in tamil and i would respond in malay because she didn't know english so i'm still amazed that i never picked up tamil because they say children are like sponges right they can pick up languages but i didn't in any case so in the last their lives their stories i'm i'm piecing together through uh, chats with my aunties and uncles and also just through my own reflections you know remembering um what they were like when i knew them when they were still alive and then digging into family history and doing my own research so it feeds into my writing i mean their lives feed into my life and into my writing i i hear what you mean by not being an individual because we really are not i mean two people made one yes <laughs> and, and those two people were made by four so i suppose we are really a combination of of many your school days did, did you grow up in in kuala lumpur or another town i grew up in port dickson uh which is about an hour and a half from KL small town i think most malaysians will know most malaysians from peninsula malaysia i would say and particularly western peninsula malaysia will know port dickson because it's one of the places that people go to for the sea for the beach unfortunately it's terribly polluted now because everybody comes to pd um so yes it's uh, as i said it's a small town um I went to school there and then I left when I was 18 as most people from PD do that's the thing about growing up in a small town is you have to leave if you want to uh, further your education or you know if you have ambitions to get a job um when elsewhere. so when you were young you were growing up and grandmama was there and yes. um, uh, did you go over for for meals or you did Yes, I mean both so I was as I said my paternal grandmother was living in PD so uh, up until she passed away when I was 
14, we would go to her house. I mean, it was the family house because she was living there. So I had another auntie whom I'm very close to, um, who now is in her mid 80s and still shares stories about the past, oh, which is fantastic. And what, what's your auntie's name? Um, she's called Rajesh Rajeshwari. <laughs> As I said, it's in the Hi, Rajeshwari. Hi, hi, auntie. <laughs> what? Because I call her mommy, right? I don't often there you go. Her name. <laughs> But yeah, Mami is, I mean, she's the source of all the stories. I still go and visit her um, and she she loves to tell tales of the past, you know, mm-hmm. 1940s, particularly Japanese occupation. Okay. <laughs> Lots of stories about that. Um, but yes, I, so when I, when I was growing up, I, I spent time with them and then the extended, other members of the extended family would come to that house. I, I know this might sound a little trivial, but um, I'm curious as to what you ate when you were at Amami's house and yeah. what what um, your grandma, what, what she cooked for you when you were young. Okay, it's not trivial at all. I, so yeah, I don't think asking about food is trivial at all. I think it's a very fundamental part of who we are and how we communicate and, and, a, and a fundamental part of our culture. And how we express love as well. That's what I remember um, about the, the cooking that used to happen and still happens, you know, in, in our family homes. Um, unfortunately, my grandmother had stopped cooking by the time I was born. So she, all I know are the stories that that describe how fantastic a cook she was, which doesn't help me at all. So I, I just know that she was a brilliant cook. But by the time I was born, because I was the youngest, um, her youngest grandchild, and I have, oh my God, I think it's something like 24 cousins. It's a very big family. This is the wow. maternal side. I know, I know. And I'm the youngest. The, the oldest one is actually the same age as my dad. So yeah, big, big family. Um, so she didn't cook, but my aunties, uh, my aunties would cook, and it was traditional food. By traditional, I mean traditionally Salonese food. So we would have the um, hoppers. Well, banana leaf would be on like special occasions if there were like fest, fest celebrations, festivities, things like that. Um, but ordinarily, I suppose it would be um, yeah cu- curries. I don't know if you know what putu is. Mm-hmm, putu, mm-hmm. yeah, putu would be one of the, the staples. Um, but also, we would cook what I would call Malaysian food, like things like laksa, okay. uh, nasi lama. You know, so it was not just Salonese food. And that's that's the beauty of. Um of these mix of cultures, isn't it? Once 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 they moved over to Malaysia, they really became Malaysians. Absolutely. I mean I'll I'll tell you like Mami, for example, she still cooks for me and it's one of her joys and my joy. So uh, her three standard dishes, I'll tell you, when she says, Oh you're back. Okay, so let's <laughs> So one is Tosa. We, in fact, I just had those a few days ago at her place and it was awesome. Yeah. And she still uses that pan. Now, I've forgotten the uh, the name for it. It's, it's a, a flat pan. pan right? The flat pan that hasn't been washed since my grandfather's time. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not gross. <laughs> That's how you can't wash it. <laughs> so, I had Tosa made on that, which was absolutely wonderful. Chapati. Chapati and potato curry. And her third signature dish is laksa. Which is absolutely fantastic. It's one of the wow, best things I've what had. a treat. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to follow you down to <laughs> PG next time. She'll be really happy. Like, as I said, it's, it's, one of, it's a very important way of um, showing love um, in, in my family and I think in many families as well. So, 18, you then left PD. And yes, I and left you jetted PD. off where? Uh, I ran off as, you know, when you grow up in a small town, you have dreams of escape. In fact, I spent all of my teenage years dreaming of leaving Malaysia. Not not leaving Malaysia, leaving Port Dixon and then the, the dream expanded, right? So I left to go to Subang Jaya. <laughs> SJ, SJ. SJ, which was, you know, at that time it was a dream. For someone from PD, SJ was a dream, which soon became, well, it didn't come a nightmare, but when it became less, um, I became a bit more disillusioned for sure. Um, I went to study um, do my A levels at Taylor's College. I was going to say, SJ, it's uh, it's either <laughs> one or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so Taylor's got you. Taylor's got me. I mean, I really enjoy my time at Taylor's. Actually, um, I 
made good friends and in fact my literature teacher from there is still my friend recently visited her in uh, London yeah I stayed in her house oh, let's do a shout out to her Michelle hi, hi Michelle <laughs> and um So then you stayed on and soon after you were boarding a jet plane. So earlier we were talking about how uh you know the dream for people in post-colonial situations often is oh going abroad right specifically to places like the UK um and also of course the US and and Australia and New Zealand. In my case it was the UK. Like my generation I think uh, going to England was you know the it's like the holy grail right and i was also studying english literature so it meant of course i had to go there well not it wasn't of course but for me i didn't have any other options i was very very clear that i wanted to go there so i left to study english at bristol university and then i stayed on um because i wasn't ready to come back to malaysia after uh i completed my first degree I wanted to stay on. I wanted to study, but I also wanted to stay on. I I think it's important I make that point. Maybe that will come up in our conversation. I don't know. How was Bristol like to you? I mean, obviously okay. you liked it. Well, very interesting experience. Um and it's as I begin to think about how we teach and how we learn, um I'm getting a lot of retrospective epiphanies about my time there very interesting as as i begin to educate myself more in education theory so right now my research is you you mentioned at the start that i've been yes. uh, moving into contemplative pedagogy and also i i'm looking at ways that we teach basically you know how do we teach and how do we learn specifically for me in the creative writing classroom because that's where um that's that's what I teach creative writing I also teach literature but I'm mainly interested in how we teach creative writing because I find that it's a very difficult subject to teach um but anyway I don't want to digress too much because so as I'm doing this research I start recognizing many of the difficulties that I experienced when I was an undergraduate at Bristol as stemming from deeper issues uh, of racism and coming from a post-colonial country and not even recognizing that things that had been normalized were not actually they were not fair. Bristol is a very it's a university especially for English yeah that that's chosen by students of a particular background. Uh so they are uh, many of them applied to Oxford and Cambridge Uh, they didn't get in so they'd come to Bristol so they come from very affluent backgrounds and they are locals they're, they're british people who have gone to public school so public school in in the uk means private school so many of them had come for money and you and you come from a certain class you know background and so um yeah you're educated in a certain way as well so many of my classmates had come from that background and all of them were white So I was one of five Asians who in in a cohort of just over 100 and I felt my difference and I even remember in one of my and I thought that that there was something wrong with me because you know I was different and I had to assimilate you know I was different and so I had to become like what they wanted me to become I had to become white essentially you know um and i remember in one of my classes as well one of my lecturers who i absolutely loved like i loved his classes but i still remember at that time this question that he asked to make me feel uncomfortable but i was too afraid to say anything and the question was would you prefer i think it was about getting a visiting writer to come to the to our department and he jokingly asked said uh, do you want a writer who's actually good or one of those token ethnic writers to come mm. question itself was set up in a way um to dismiss to dismiss where i stood where i come from so i found that also the many of the the way the teaching strategies weren't inclusive so i, I couldn't find myself in my education mm. i couldn't find myself in what i was reading granted many of the texts were texts that were distanced from me in terms of time and space but i think a good education should allow for students to still find themselves in Shakespeare and in in Chaucer and I just felt that the education actually disconnected me further from what I was reading I I I always find that for example when I'm in Australia I'm considered a CALD person of culturally and linguistic difference 
a mm-hmm. person who is culturally and linguistically different, which I find really quite funny, because aren't we all? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, here has the norm, you see, different yeah, exactly. from what? Yes. <laughs> different so, from what? Yes. So that's why the the norm is Caucasian white. Yes. yes. Uh, male, yes. and and hence the reason for this podcast. Mm. So I, I really thank you for speaking out on on that uh, experience, uh, Shivani, because it it must have bugged you for a while, and it must have also at the same time propelled you towards where you are today. Absolutely, absolutely. So one um, wonderful thing that happened during that time was a course that was offered in year two, which was called postcolonial literature. So I tell you, when when I started that course it was like a breath of fresh air and I thought something is happening I mean they weren't covering Malaysian texts but it didn't matter it was texts um, written by people who were from all around you know the world so African texts Caribbean texts um, you know broadly Asian texts and suddenly I felt like oh I, I can see myself here and and these are stories that I recognize even though it's coming from part in a, a, a place in Africa it doesn't matter I can see myself here so that basically inspired me. It gave me new energy. And I actually wrote my final year dissertation on two Nigerian authors. And then I went on to do an MA in colonial and post-colonial literature at Warwick. And, and the whole environment changed when I went there. I found um, there was a lot more diversity, but maybe it was because I was at a center for translation and comparative cultural studies. So I was meeting people from various parts of the world, mainly the West Indies. So it was a very, the, the MA was fantastic and so fantastic that I stayed on <laughs> to do my PhD in comparative literature. So what was the title of your PhD in, in full? Cooley Cartography, Crossing Frontiers Through Coolitude. <laughs> you can see the poet in me was trying to come through <laughs> all the uh, alliteration. Basically, I was studying Indian indentureship in literature. So after the British abolished slavery, they replaced slavery with another system that was basically basically slavery in disguise. And it was called Indian indentureship or Cooley indentureship. And they basically shipped close to 2 million um, people from India to various parts of the world, including Malaya. They were the involuntary soldiers who fought the, the British war as well. Uh, even yes. in Penang, uh, when Francis Knight called for help, the headquarters didn't send their troops um, because he had already promised the Sultan that you know I would provide protection, but um, he was just a salesman. Um, he didn't get HQ to approve and sign and it was actually the Indian soldiers from mm. from Bombay or Calcutta or Goa that came to his rescue here in Penang uh, when when Penang got invaded by I think it was the Siams. Mm. Mm. Um, it's it's quite interesting because even in Australian history, there's a lot of stories about how the soldiers were made up of uh, Aboriginal Australians. Mm. and Chinese Australians or uh, Australians of different colour um, mm. but not much is known about about that so that's what history is isn't it? Absolutely and I think that's why it's so important to unearth stories because his story you know it's a story so there are perspectives there's so many versions that need to be told because history is not just one thing that happened once in one way. It's histories, really. And many voices have been suppressed and people have talked for other people, you know, on behalf of other people. And it's really important for people, especially people who have been subjugated for a long time, to speak, to reclaim, you know, to, to reclaim the power of their voice. That's why I say this 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 podcast is, is, is important, you know, important, even if Five people listen to it, you know. It's being disseminated in some way and there's there's a power in just speaking and in being heard. I think it is definitely time for the tokenism of our voices to be united, um, mm. but not as individuals, but as a collective. Absolutely. Can you give us a little bit more description as to the, the types of foods that Amami makes for you and also your grandma? Uh, just more detail. What's in it? What's in it, you know? No, I have to. 
gosh. Um, I have to put on my Nigella Lawson cap and describe food <laughs> in a way that's really appealing. Uh, I don't think I can do that, but um, I can try to recall some of the food that has been cooked for me uh, over the last few years. Um, I mean, not few years, but decades. So, but as I said, paternal grandmother didn't cook for me because she wasn't well. By the time I was born, she was already, she wasn't walk. She was bedridden at a certain point. So that's why she, she couldn't move around very much. So my maternal grandmother cooked a lot of food. As I said, putu was one of them. What is um, putu? Okay, you're asking me. So I have to also, the other thing that I'm confessing, apart from being a coconut, is that I am not a good traditional cook. So I, I cook just, you know, one pot things. Okay. And so if you ask me um, what goes into things, uh, this is when I would say my sister would be the better person to ask or my, my mum. In fact, my mother has been urging me to take cooking lessons and maybe I should. Um, so it's made of flour primarily, but there's a particular way of um, cooking it. Um, and there is also a device that's used to make the putu. So it's like this, um, like a tube, like a long wooden tube. But I don't think people use that anymore, actually, because my mother makes it without that and she just steams it. So it's steamed. It's like a, you could say it's a replacement for rice. So it's mainly made of atta flour. Um, and then they put coconut um, on top at the end, that's that's optional. And people eat that with either banana, so it can be a sweet thing. So you can have that with banana or sometimes with brown sugar, um, but I don't really like that. I tend to eat that with, with eat it with potatoes. So that's one of the staple dishes, not staples, but it's one of the dishes that my mum will make, for example, on Fridays, because Fridays we are vegetarian. That's the Hindu um, custom which is followed in our house. Um, so she'll make putu with um, fried potatoes. So that's one sort of dish that we, we all like. Um, and that's also traditional. The others would be things like dal, you know, dal um, parapu. So it's it's lentils, right? Um, the other is sambar. So that's a very South Indian slash Salonis uh, dish. And um, it's sort of watery. It's lentil, but it's watery and it's got lots of vegetables in it. And I believe that sometimes people put in meat, um, but we don't. So it's just a range of vegetables like carrots and cauliflower, aubergine. And, and then, sambal is not sambal. That's not different. sambal. The, in fact, it has no resemblance to sambal at all. Right. <laughs> because it's it's like, it's quite watery, the soupy. Um, but it's eaten with, um, and, and it's, as I said, it's um, lentils and then various vegetables. And we have that with rice. The other thing is also string hoppers, which I think like, Malaysians will know this is one of the dishes that has gone into the Malaysian repertoire. I think sometimes you call it putu mayam as well. The other would be, as I said, tose and itli. Do you know itli? Mm-hmm. It resembles, to me, like the texture resembles pao, but it's sour it's sour and so those are some of the dishes that come to mind in terms of the traditional ones and as i said we're very big on laksa in our family so because it's my favorite dish ever so if someone says what's your what would be your last meal if let's say you were incarcerated and you asked what would be and you were on death row what would be your last yes it would be laksa that yeah i know there are different types of laksa i'm, I'm aware that you you know if you say laksa be like, which kind of laksa um the one made in my house <laughs> One. Yeah, and also this is definitely putting me on the spot. Definitely, nobody's asked me to talk about food. I mean, I love food, but I'm definitely not a person to go to for like recipes or, um, you know, to, to describe. I'm not a foodie in that sense. But but you love, you know, what you love. I do. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Any other joys um, in your life besides food and family? Uh, food, family. Well, nature really i mean nature i say that it, i know it's a vast generalization but i love i love being in nature I, I love walking in in nature when i can and i just love spending time like with my feet you know on the ground and, and smelling the soil and, and 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 watching the wildlife around me so i you know i grew up in port dixon in that sort of environment in fact that inspired my first book because my first book is called Wildlife on Coal Island and it's basically each it's a collection of short stories and each story features some kind of element from 
um, nature, so either a bird or a tree or something. And I didn't plan it out that way. So it wasn't like contrived in that sense. I didn't conceptualize it. But it just sort of appeared. But it's it's sort of inevitable, I think, because I always was very much connected with the natural world around me. Because growing up in PD in the 80s, it was still quite jungly, especially where we were living. So we'd have things like, you know, we'd have like pythons. We still do, by the way. Cobras, pythons like hanging around close by. Um, we had like bats living in our roof. Uh, squirrels like hanging out in the curtains, you know. And that kind of boundary between inside and outside was blurred. Um, and so I, where I live now in Cyberjaya, I've picked a place that has that. So I live near the lake. There's a lake in Cyberjaya. Um, you must come visit me one day, Jasmine. You know, we go for walks there. I have monkeys. Not I have monkeys, but there are monkeys that are living, you know, just opposite me. So I like to sit on the balcony and just kind of watch. Shivani, if I were to bump into you, let's say in, in the UK or somewhere outside of Malaysia, how would you, and I don't know you, right? How would you introduce yourself? Uh, and I don't know you at all? Yes. Okay. Uh, I am Shivani Sivaguru Nadan and I am a writer and teacher from Malaysia. That w- is that does that satisfy? I mean I could go on, but I think in terms of like a basic introduction, that's how I see, you know, like a in a nutshell, my primary identity. Do you have um, uh, uh, books that you're working on and what's coming up next? What's what's in the horizon? Okay, so it has been a busy couple of years for me and um, I have two books coming out this year. One is, as you mentioned in your very generous introduction earlier, one is a collection of poems called Being Born um, and that should be out in a couple of months. And my book of fiction is also coming out around the same time. What is What has happened to Harry Pillay? Two novellas. That's the book of fiction. And I am also working on a novel. So currently what I'm doing is I am... You've got three, three things in the oven. Collection of poems. It's not poems that I just wrote in the last you know few months. So I have been writing poetry for a long time. I have two books coming out. I have a collection of poems... That's going to be coming. That's going to be out in a couple of months, and then I also have a book of fiction, two novellas, what has happened to Harry Pillay, and the poems were written over twenty years, so it's not just stuff that I've written now. Although during lockdown, I started writing poetry every day, and I will be reading wow. some poems today from that. I'll, yeah, um, maybe just before I'm reading the poems, I'll, I'll talk more about what. I had in mind when I was writing those poems Um, and so yeah so it wasn't as if I just wrote everything in the last few months and the book of fiction uh, one novella was written actually a while ago a number of years ago um, but I reworked it now like this year and then I wrote a new novella um, to go with that and the current novel I'm working on is really in the very very initial stages so it's where I'm doing research at the moment um, and then just kind of trying things out and yeah so I'm not sure when that's even going to be ready it could take one year it could take 10 years I really have no idea I I understand um, books is also something that runs in a family and you know you've got two school teachers as parents but what about your siblings? Are they are they also in the industry? It's interesting that you ask. My sister is um, she actually is uh, the CEO of an educational agency called Maybex. That's her day job. Um, so she they they are responsible for advising Malaysians who want to study in the UK. So still in the education line in some way. <laughs> um, but her. Her side job is actually as a literary agent. So uh, years ago, I, I told her, I think you would be a very good agent because she has the, the skills. You know, she's very good with, um, I don't know, getting things done, talking to people. <laughs> and she also loves books. So she reads a lot. Um, in fact, both of us always have some books, you know, that we're reading. Uh, not the same books, but we'll always have some 
book that we're reading, you know, on the go, right? Um, sometimes we'll recommend books to each other, things like that. So she and her her friend uh, started up a literary agency. It's called Siva Gurunathan and Chua Literary Agency, or SCLA. Roz, who is my agent, so I signed with them, obviously. <laughs> I didn't sign with my sister because I don't, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to work with family. <laughs> um, and Ross is based in Penang and my sister is based in KL. So yeah, so that it is it is very much in the family in, in that sense. I think it's really awesome. I mean, your par- parents must be so, so proud of you. Um, you know, I, I'm sure they've also bought like a couple of copies to give to friends. Yes, yes, they have, they have. Um, yeah, they are very, very um, supportive. I mean, they come when they can. They come for my events. Uh, I had a, an event in PD, for example, last year, and it was really nice to have them there. And if they are things in KL, I mean, these days, not so much because they don't really like to travel very much. But in the earlier days, they used to come for my whatever. I was, if I was doing like a launch or whatever, um, they would come. Yeah. Do you have a website? I do. Yes, it what is, is it? it's it's my name actually, Shivani Sivagurunathan.com. Okay, that's easy peasy. And how can people contact you? Um, they can contact me. Should I give my email address? It's or, up to you. Actually, um, I'm on Instagram and I'm also on Facebook and both are I, I just wanted to share that um, the reason why this came about also for this podcast was not only that I was recording my mom uh, while she was telling me, you know, grandmother tales and stories, but it was also because when I was um, living in Sydney, there was a lot of talk about the governments of India, Australia, uh, the UK, all coming together and trying to protect the South China Seas mm. um, from from China. And uh, I mean, they're threatening war. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's billions of dollars of gases and mm. natural resources there. Yes. China has also been inching and, and you know, mm-hmm. building land reclamation projects but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's it's a playground that's the south china sea Mm. um which shares its borders with probably 11 to 12 or maybe more countries Mm. malaysia being malaysia being one of them yeah um so that was the reason why we wanted you know to Mm -hmm. interview and speak to this 99 women Mm. who basically are women whose heritage or even whose homes are um, on the shores of these countries where the South China Sea touches. Mm. So yeah. thank you so very much for sharing so much of you and and you know what makes you you um, for sharing so much detail into the richness of what's in your books. Um, I think I, I've learned so much from you as well from, from this. I, I, I feel like I should go out there and, and have a Sri Lankan meal if I can <laughs> find a good one <laughs> in Penang. Uh, they're not that common, actually, Sri Lankan restaurants, but I do know one, in a very good one in Sydney, in Glebe. Also in KL, I think there's a, there's a very good one, but very expensive. Expensive, yes. <laughs> And my ex boss was um, from Sri Lanka, so I used to go to her house. That was that was yes. lovely. I was going to say, better you go to somebody's house. <laughs> yes, uh, well, that was uh, Shahara De Silva. Hello to you, Shahara. <laughs> she's she's currently in Sri Lanka, um, and mm-hmm. her meals were amazing. But well, basically, I I am now going to sign off. And um, uh, thanks so much, Shivani, for for your time well thank you so much Jasmine for um, giving me the the time and your ear Uh, it's not about me (laughs) (laughs) so enjoy and subscribe to Listen by Heart podcast on your favourite platform 
be it the Apple Podcasts, which is um, the short link is bit.ly B-I-T dot L-Y slash Listen by Heart Podcast. We're also on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Player FM and etc. The official website is listenbyheart.webprojects.com and it's spelled W-E-B-P-R-O-J-X. You've been listening to Jasmine Lowe's Audio Journey Experience, an AFT podcast production. Subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform and if you'd like to encourage us on, find out how you can support the production by visiting our website. It's https colon double backslash listen by heart dot w-e-b-p-r-o-j-x dot com Listen by Heart podcast is an audio project that sets out to record and archive stories from women of the South China Sea, an area of much interest lately. As we document and record all of these stories, we will also be digitizing and creating an online presence for women of Southeast Asian heritage and honoring the women who came before them. Our mission is to serve as the sentinels of the South China Sea, keeping our region at peace. Thank you.